our group's doing a lot of different things. Uh, I'm going to focus on just a couple things here for the sake of the time. Um, we're comparing two illnesses, Gulf War and chronic fatigue syndrome. They have very similar presentations and they're equally complex. So we thought they were good comparator illnesses. And in our research institute, we're real excited because when we got a Gulf War Illness Consortia grant about five years ago, when we found out we were funded, all the senior investigators chose to relocate to South Florida. So we brought four different universities, senior investigators to one site, and it's been a highly productive um, effort. I should also say that the one-year grant we got to develop the grant built that relationship. It would never have happened if we hadn't actually spent a lot of time with each other the year before. So it was a good investment from the DOD's perspective, but also um, we we're reaping, and this field is reaping chronic fatigue syndrome as well, um, all these rewards. So we have a lot of different people. Right now that we have roughly 60 people in our research group, about 14 faculty members. And uh, we cover a lot of different ground. And uh, Marianne Fletcher, who's here, is um, the reason why we ever got in this together. Marianne and I have been partnered for many years as the clinical and laboratory partners in, a, in this uh, venture. But over the years, we've gathered more folks. So we have uh, computational biology, animal modeling. Uh, we have um, stress, stress response studies, genomics, uh, cell biology, and then um, environmental medicine and most recently integrative medicine uh, clinicians to try to roll out to clinical practice things that seem reasonable. Uh, many of you may not know about Gulf War illness. We're talking about the first Gulf War in 1991. It was a very short war, about six weeks long. Um, but the veterans of that war had a tremendous amount of toxin exposures, particularly neurotoxins. And roughly one in three is still sick today, disabling ill. And this is, I stole from your own website here, so CFS, you recognize the picture? Anyway, ME, I'm not going to tell you what ME is, but you know it. So thinking about modeling complex illnesses, you do genetic predisposition. What were the triggers? So we have, you know, was it a neurotoxin? Is it an infection? What, what are the different types of uh, potential triggering events? But what really matters right now are what are the mediators of persistence? And I think that's what most of us are focused on because our patients are already sick, and now we need to try to figure ways to get them well again. And uh, that would be the result of the, th the uh, illness that we see. So you see from a lot of different work from different groups, ours included, that there's a lot of different types of targeted therapeutic approaches, things that are focusing on mitochondria, on antivirals, neuroinflammation, inflammation, pain, immune activation, adrenal function, uh, autonomic dysfunction. And none of these are wrong. The problem is that they're all thought of separately, and the illness is a illness of multiple systems, and all these things are going on in many patients, or at least some of them are going on in many patients. So we tend to think of the whole thing as a homeostasis issue, that there's an illness that resulted from someone going from a healthy state to a chronically sick state, and there are mediators that keep that chronically sick state in a homeostatic balance. Now very early on and ever since, Dr. Fletcher and I have worked a lot on the immune function of these patients, and some of you have seen these types of slides before with immune activation, pro-inflammatory cytokine expression, Th1, Th2 imbalances, uh, profound NK cell defects, and then when you look in the cytotoxic T cells, you see perforin and granzyme defects at the gene activation as well as the protein level. A lot of different things going on by immunology, including neuroinflammation by PET imaging by some other groups. When you look at just is any biomarker a good biomarker for diagnostics? And you take a classic rock curve like you see there on the right. This is NK cell function. And in fact, it's a darn good biomarker. Um, red is Gulf War. White is chronic fatigue syndrome. So you see Gulf War patients have even more impaired NK cell dysfunction. But you can look at many different types of things. And this is um, looking at cytokine panels above and below the line. And if you look at things that are elevated, uh, red is chronic fatigue syndrome, versus things that are deficient. It's interesting what's deficient are the things that would improve NK cell function if they were normal, and things that are anti-inflammatory or, or chemotaxis, and the things that are elevated are neuroinflammatory and Th2 regulatory cytokines. Th2 is B cell regulatory cytokines. So is a sort of over, over generalization, but when you're thinking about 
an illness that might have an autoimmune signature, a subgroup with an autoimmune signature, you would think TH2. So, so it sort of fits with some other things going on. Now, when you find a biomarker, this is what was it? it was Beth that was talking about biomarkers that are treatment. Was it Beth that said that? That were treatment targets. So when you find that IL-15 is actually a damn good biomarker, or rather a deficiency of IL-15, you also makes you think, well, what would happen if I fix that? So in vitro, when you add IL-15 in vitro, you completely correct the NK cell um, abnormality. So this is something that our group is hoping to take further. If we can get the company with IL-15 to play with us. It's been a while of us asking nicely. <laughs> so, so that's sort of the one thing at a time approach. But when you think of things as homeostasis, and you're looking at all the systems together, you need a whole lot uh, bigger approach. And this is where the, the amazing field of computational biology comes in when you can deal with great big, lots and lots of numbers with lots and lots of complexity. So this is the, the uh, computational team with standing amongst the supercomputers. But when we're, we're looking at what we're trying to look, you can look at, uh, at where everyone's trying to look when there's computational biology. You can look at gene, transcripts, proteins, metabolome, cells themselves, all the way up to organs, and then symptoms, one step higher. This is that intracellular level. We have data for that that links to cell level, that looks to cell cell signaling level, that gives us actual domains of illness and symptom severity, and all of these things in the connected dots approach of trying to understand um, what came first, the chicken or the egg. Because we get a tr tremendous signature here, and there's a lot of things going on. So when you're looking at mediators of relapse, it'd be really nice to know what was first, what was second, what's downstream. Because you'd like to be intervening way up front, not way back here, which is where we tend to be. So if you think of MECFS as a homeostatic disruption, then you can also think about homeostasis as a, is there a way to reboot, to reset, to re, redo all of this? And that's hot where we are. And again, you look at these systems that we know are dysfunctional, and you say, oh, well, what if we look at them all at one time? And we know that they're interactive. So it's no great surprise that when we do our homeostatic modeling and actually try to find interventions, there's no one trick. There's no one button that forces this back into balance. It's always two or more buttons. Big surprise. We're working in multiple systems here. So just fixing the immune system is not enough. Just fixing the endocrine system is not enough. Um, but when we start doing things in combinations, at least in, in the computer modeling systems, then we start seeing really good things. So, like many other people, we've used exercise because we know it makes people have a relapse. We try to keep the relapse very small, very mini. So like other people you've heard today, we don't pick, take people over their aerobic threshold. We bring them up to it. Because we know when we go to anaerobic, when we get beyond the aerobic threshold, you really have a nasty relapse. So, um, so we f calculate what the aerobic threshold is, and we exercise people right up to it. And we measure bloods. And, uh, all kinds of biomarkers, which I will explain. So in the very first time we did this, we only did three points in time. We looked at time zero, 15 minutes, and four hours later. And we put people on a bike to VO2 max. The average was eight minutes. There's some people that could only get to three minutes. There are several people we had to disqualify because they were already over the aerobic threshold getting up on the bike. So uh, you couldn't safely uh, study them. But this is what's so fascinating. At 15 minutes, just doing a simple jingo, forget the computational guys. These are just like off the shelf um, and the analytic pa patterns. The top 10 pathways that are engaged 15 minutes after the exercise challenge was started and after it's now been over about at least eight, you know, five or six or seven minutes, 10 of 10 are immune signaling pathways. Of all the pathways there are, now granted these are PBMCs, it's the immune system we're looking at, but there are plenty of pathways in a, in a white blood cell that are, go beyond inflammatory signaling or signaling. So that's fascinating. But this is even more fascinating. Four hours later, before they're starting to feel sick, you don't see a lot of immunology in the next 10 top 10. What do you see? You see oxidative stress, you see autonomic pathways, you see sensory pathways, you see uh, stress response, you know, HPA axis pathways. You see nitric oxide, more oxidative stress pathways. 
top 10, no one's not immune, top 10 are metabolic pathways. So putting the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart. Put the horse before the cart. The horse is the great big inflammatory drive that happens very, very quickly into an exercise challenge. So we handed this off to the computational guys, and they said, I'm sorry, you can't do dynamic modeling with three points in time. It's not dynamic enough. So redo. So we had to rewrite all these grants and go all over again, I mean, several years of, lots of years of work of, of redoing it all. But now we have nine points in time data where we measure people twice before they go, three minutes, five minutes, peak of exercise if it hasn't already happened, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours, next day. Nine points in time. And now, and we do um, the whole gene expression platform, we do the large cytokine platforms, we do flow cytometry, we do cell function, we do all the neuropeptides we know how to measure. We give them all this data. And we don't do the metabolome, but we should, huh? We give them all this data. And, uh, and they say, well, yeah, no, that's only about a million data points per patient per time, nine million data points. That's not much, but I'll see what I can do. <laughs> and I'm like, ah! <laughs> I'm like a chi-square kind of girl, you know? <laughs> I need group A, group B. Anyway, this is very interesting what you, you hash out. First, call for and chronic fatigue syndrome. As much as I am a clinician that has seen hundreds of call for patients and many, many thousands of chronic fatigue patients, they aren't clinically different. You can't tell them apart. There's nothing about them that you could clinically tell them apart. But genomically, and after an exercise challenge, when you re really ramp up the signal, boy, are they different, you know? Though they have some sameness. So what's first is interesting is in the case of MECFS, what you see is a tremendous decrement in metabolic pathways when you do this kind of exercise challenge. Whereas with Gulf War, you see a tremendous upregulation of alternate signaling pathways. So they're trying to get past it. Um, if you map, Network map, this is when you say, okay, there's this, this um, gene path and there's gene, this gene path. Are they talking to each other? And how many genes do I have to work through? How many pathways do I have to work through before these two are communicating with each other? So this is really cool because it takes in what's working correctly as well as what's working incorrectly into the analysis. And when you see a normal person, you see a spider web of communication. Average link 10, average number of pathways 3. So it's like, yeah, you can see, you can sort of see through that, right? With Gulf War, there's so many pathways engaged, it's, you can't even look at it, right? You can't see through that. It's a huge number of upregulated pathways. Chronic fatigue syndrome, there's no talking. Everything's shut down. There's no communication between anybody. So big surprise that instead of seeing with inflammation upregulated, that the anti-inflammatory pathways should then upregulate, they fail. You don't get a cortisol bump after inflammation. It turns off, it doesn't turn on. So this is like opposite land, right? They aren't the same, but they present very similarly. Now you can take any one of those funky little lines there, like that line there, and you can blow it up to something like that and look at the interactions between these linkages. And again, even in this kind of rudimentary um, healthy control versus chronic fatigue syndrome, immune communication between cells and cytokines, you see it's quite different. It's they're just structurally. Those things aren't looking at all the same. And what you see is a muted Th1, a muted Th17. These are the antiviral, if you would, cytokines that would drive a better antiviral um, effort. Th2, the ones that um, would regulate autoimmunity up, and the things that uh, regulate NK cell down. And then you can try to work it through all the hormones, and then you start getting something really complicated that I'm not going to try to explain. But the point is, what we're looking at is up here, but the amount of, of communication is huge. And the real important stuff might well be below the surface of what, we're seeing, what we typically look at. So again, in our most simple early work, um, when we just had three points in time, you could take one thing like interleukin-1, and you could say, well, what happens in a healthy control? Well, in 15 minutes, you've induced cortisol. And in four hours, it's just hitting one of the cytokines there. But in Gulf Oralness, in this case, you take IL-1, and in 15 minutes, you're hitting all kinds of activity. You're really hitting a lot of new buttons that are hitting buttons that aren't immune buttons necessarily upstream. So you're seeing some, we call this a splash effect, and then it gives us some 
mediator that we might want to chase after when we start doing these kinds of, of uh, designs. So the, another oversimplified thing, this is again us going back a few years, when we just look at the HPA axis regulation, the computational biologists really could come up with a strategy to reboot the HPA system. And it was not keeping in mind all the other systems interacting. This is a paper that was out about 2009, but it was a nice little thing. And I, the guys would call me up and say, well, hey, Nancy, I have this great idea. What if you just shut the adrenal gland off for like 15 minutes? And I said, well, honey, that's nice, but you can't do that. You know, and I said, okay, okay, it's okay, we're going to go back. And they said, what if you just like damp it down for like four hours? And I said, well, let me think if there's a drug that can damp down adrenal uh, response for four hours. Well, it turns out that there are, and one of the, the big ones um, are the glucocorticoid receptor antagonists. There's more than one now, but there's one that's FDA approved, which is mifepristone, um, which is used in Cushing's to block adrenal action. So now we actually have a drug we can play with. It's also RU486, the abortion drug. So it's really a hard one to talk to Congress about. But, the, uh, but anyway, so that's one thing. Cool. We got an HPA model that's kind of cool. Maybe you could reboot it. But then you put it in the big complexity. And you say, wait, wait, if there's, that's important. What about all the other hormones? And then you start getting these crazy um, diagrams that look at gender differences. And even within a gender, the, there's a like an estrus phase difference than follicular phase, or that there's a postmenopausal uh, look, and that we might actually have different models of treatment based on the HPG pathway, the one that no one ever talks about. And yet it's critically important, and then our testosterone um, is a key feature in the male um, model. So that's really interesting. So we get back to what we're doing. We're saying, okay, in healthy people, here's the, the endocrine system, the immune system, the autonomic nervous system, all the neuropeptides, all playing together. I have a cold right now, so I'm not right there. I'm like right here. But when I'm done, I would hope I would bounce back to my old spot. But if you had something happen that brought you up over the mountain and dropped you into this new spot, this is your balance. And you can't go back here. It's not a straight line. You have to climb the mountain to get back. And so when we do the mathematical modeling of how to get back, it's never a straight line. It's all about how do you perturbate the system enough it has to find a new steady state. And then how do you shove it in a steady state way that drives it back? So this is one such study. This is in Gulf War illness. I say that because we're really far along. Let's just say we're really well funded in Gulf War illness. And we have been able to take the virtual modeling through both cell models and animal models all the way to human clinical trial because we had the funding mechanisms to do that. And this is what basically what the in silico thing said, was in Gulf War illness, if you could block um, the pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade long enough to reduce neuroinflammation, and then block the HPA access long enough to force it to do an internal reboot, reset, that you could, if you did it in that time course, one and then two, hypothetically reboot the whole system back to normal. Sounded crazy. But in Gulf War illness, we have an animal model that's darn good. We took our, our dynamic modeling model, and we looked at all the animal models that are out there for Gulf War illness, and we actually had people do exercise challenges on the animals and do the dynamic modeling in the animals and found the best fit. And we picked that model as our um, testing model. And then we aged that animal out after we induced the illness, the equivalent of 10 years of illness. And then we did this. And we rebooted. We brought neuroinflammation down about 50%, which is, was enough. And then we threw the, uh, the mifepristone dose in there, and a single dose of mifepristone. And we rebooted those animals back to normal. The autonomic function normalized. Their immune function normalized. Their neuroendocrine balance all normalized. And we can challenge these animals and get normal dynamic models out of them. So we are over the moon that our very first uh, best model, and the, let me tell you that when you, I say the first model, you run 20,000 clinical trials in silico before you come up with the best model. But when we took the best of those many clinical trials and we put it into an animal model, we were successful. And now we are funded by the DOD to do that in human, and it's through the IRB. It's back in the DOD human subjects office right now, waiting for the final approval. And we will be running this clinical trial before Christmas. 
So it's very, very exciting. Now, I know we don't have an animal model for ME-CFS, and I don't think we need one. If, my, if we prove in principle that we did this when there was an available animal model and it was successful, I'm willing to take a safe set of drugs forward in a, uh, in a human clinical trial. So I've asked a private foundation that I do some work for to uh, fund our first phase one in uh, ME-CFS, and they have agreed to do so. So we would hope to be in um, human clinical trial and MECFS. Oh, by the way, we've had these models worked out in MECFS for a long, long time. We just haven't been able to find a way to, to move forward. But when we got the strength of that animal data, it really galvanized our resolve to get it going. And so um, I'm very excited to say that we will be getting that going. Also, we have a very big gender difference. I have a men with MECFS uh, NIH grant that Marianne and I are doing underway and we have enough data to have a preliminary model and we have a private um, donor trying to get us enough money to get the phase one. So I'm kind of hoping that we're going to be able to do both phase ones without having to wait for the NIH cycle and, and just get it done and then go to the NIH, I hope, with the phase two. Let's hope, let's hope, let's hope. So this is our basic scheme. We get a lot of data having with a dynamic challenge. By the way, we get a much better signal, just like everyone else said. When you challenge, the baseline signal is not nearly as clear as the one that, um, immediately post-exercise or any other time post-exercise. We do a ton of studies. We do the in silico muscle lifting. We apply, I believe, this chaos theory. <laughs> I put that one because I need to learn how to do the word cloud because I could add some more words. But uh, we apply chaos theory and create that. Test it in the critter. Go back. Reanalyze. Make sure it really worked. Design the study, and that's where we're headed right now, and that's where we want to be, happily ever after. So that's exciting. So, concluding slide. <laughs> the uh, two concluding slides. So the exciting thing, and we're doing a lot of other work, and I don't, I can't, I didn't want to list everything, although I might make a plug for one of our studies. But the, uh, the, uh, I love this um, computational biology approach. We're very excited about it. We're very excited that we can take a signal from intracellular through to symptom profile and get a model going based on that. Um, and we're testing a lot of other things. In Gulf War illness, like I say, we have so much further along. We have our models really worked out, and we were clinically funded to do um, our in vitro models and our animal models. So we have clinical trial, uh, high throughput modeling for um, trying out different drugs in our cell, cell model. Um, but based on that, we already have an NF-kappa-B targeted treatment using curcumin versus liposomal glutathione in a CUL4 study. We're doing the homeostatic reset I just described. We're doing aggressive subgrouping strategies. I was just funded to do a phase, uh, well, 2A really, um, rituximab study in Gulf War illness. And I have an autoantibody sign signature there to identify the subgroup. Um, we have oxidative stress uh, phase 3 study underway. Uh, we're using CoQ10 as the intervention. And so you can see, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, that the Gulf War illness, with its much shorter time that we've been studying it, and our much fewer number of subjects, there's 22 clinical trials, and we have five of them at our site. So we're aggressively pursuing interventions. There's some practical implications I'd just like to mention because there's patients in the room. Medications that are directed at reducing inflammation, oxidative stress, particularly neuroinflammation, have some promising, reasonably preliminary data. They're so safe that they're reasonable to consider, and we do this in our own clinical practice. Toxins are nasty. The detoxification pathways are the thing the two diseases have in common. They both have very poor detoxification pathways. COMT, naphthalene pathways, very, very abnormal. So avoiding things that would expose you to that, like pesticides, gasoline, naphthalene, which is um, mothballs, very nasty things for, for patients. Stress is bad for you, and I'm not saying stress as in, you know, this is a stress disease, but the way we make the animal model is we uh, give them an exposure to a neurotoxin, and then we give them cortisol, and then we do it again, and then we give them cortisol. We do it twice, and they're chronically ill forever, okay? So the idea there is that if you have a neuroinflammatory event in the context of a big physiologic stress response, that's the setup, and it's also the setup for relapse. So... 
So I like the idea of reducing stress responses, to reducing stress. And anyone that's here that's coping with this illness knows that coping is a big chunk of it. And uh, exercise intolerance, knowing with good sense not to exceed your aerobic threshold. And ever is probably a good idea. We wrap our patients up with uh, pulse monitors and tell them what it is and tell them to stay below that. And then optimize anything you can that's cellular um, energy. You measure it first, B12, vitamin D, things that would make you um, potentially deficient. You should fix all that. So uh, that's what we're doing. Identifiable, treatable, and new therapies will follow new understandings. I stole that slide from Gordon Broderick. He showed it to you before. <laughs> These are all our funding uh, sources, and we're incredibly grateful for all of them. We're going to add Solve CFS after yet the slide that you showed us uh, earlier that Lubov's study was funded. I appreciate that. Uh, and we intend to continue working on this until, by God, we are with you in solving this. So that's the main thing. Thank you. Okay.